Um, so today we're going to start um, our uh, lecture on uh, the second part of the book, and that's to talk about travel writing. Um, and uh, we're going to be uh, dealing with uh, Voltaire's um, book called Candy. Um, before we start with the book, will you just have to learn a little bit about the 18th century and the historical events that took place, the major elements in the history and politics that actually affected um, the writing of Voltaire and the themes that he addresses in his book, Henry. Okay? So, um, and, uh, there has, um, uh, there were two major historical um, or major uh, upheavals in Europe that actually happened during the 18th century. And that is actually the Glorious Revolution. Um, that happened uh, in 1688, and the French Revolution that happened um, towards the end of the 18th century, 1789. Okay, um, so this uh, the 18th century could be characterized by political turmoil. There is a revolution taking place, um, and and you know that the 18th century basically is the century is the beginning or actually the century called um, the Enlightenment period or covers the period of the Enlightenment that comes right after the Renaissance. Um, and so Europe during this time period, um, there's a rapid expansion in European power around the globe. And Europe actually arises at it as a superpower. And you should know why and what contributes to actually European Europe ascendancy in terms of power and around the world and then establishing themselves as a superior power. Yeah, if you won, they think that they're powerful actually um, position from the downfall the downfall of major empires during that time period, which is the Persian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Mongolian Empire. Okay? So, um, Europe during the 18th century emerges as a superpower. And, um, and so, because of this power they have, they start establishing colonies around the world. Right? And, and this, uh, this leads to expansion of European power and and uh, around the world, and it actually leads to these exceptions of colonies leads to the contact between European and then European um, people in territory, right? Um, and so how does this affect the travel rights? How does this actually affect travel rights? Uh, for commercial purposes? Uh, and trade, there could be. Uh huh. Okay, so this contact actually leads to a lot of yes, writing on travel, and these travel writings actually um, are part of like different genres. There could be the historical, the cultural, the anthropological, the political, and the social, right? So Europeans um, are, are, are expanding um, in the world. They're having this contact with non-European territories. So the people who travel to these places are interested either in writing about the cultures and the political systems, um, uh, religious beliefs uh, in, uh, of the, the, their people. Uh, and so, um, and, or they could be writing about the history of this contact and the history of the people they get in contact with. And uh, what else? Um, uh, and, uh, and they could write about the ways of life, traditions. And so there has been, the, there, there's a rapid, a rapid emergence of actually travel writing during the 18th century due to the European contact with the other. Um, and uh, so uh, there's like both types of travel writing that get, um, um, that get published or get, or, or, or get published, which is factual travel writing and non-factual travel writing. And, and what is happening in Europe during this time period also? There is that um, actually emergence of the middle class appetite uh, for reading. So the middle class is interested in reading. And during this time, actually, there is uh, the invention of the printing machine. And so what happens with the invention of the printing machine? There's a lot of publications, a lot of, a lot of um, um, uh, publications in different venues, 
illness. There's a, a basically magazines, periodicals, newspapers, and books being published in in in, in large um, amounts. And 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 so that helps actually to increase on um, the the middle class readership. And so part of the the major um um major um uh, publications during the 18th century were actually religious and political tracts. Okay, and and another also type of writing also emerged during the 18th century, which is travel writing. And it becomes very popular, both fictional and factual travel on the earth. Um, okay. And so, um, travel writing does not start basically in the 18th century. And it does not start with actually that um, European expansion in, um, in other territories. Actually, there's a whole history of travel writing that starts by basically one of the founding books, actually, um, and a literary work in, uh, in uh, uh, one of the, the, the founding literary works, which is actually the Odyssey by Wilmer. Does anybody know um, the Odyssey? It's an epic, yeah. Um, epical work that, that follows the adventures of a uh, protagonist called Odysseus, right? And it talks about his obstacles, the, 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 the obstacles that he faces while traveling that time. And what other um, founding works um, in travel um, uh, that establishes or is part of the travel writing history? Did you guys read this that section? So it's basically um, a book written by basically Herodotus, and it's a first, fourth century BC book. So we're talking about travel um, narratives being written um, prior uh, in the BC actually era. And so um, the, his book, a book on travel, can be considered like a guide book to tourists who come to um, Greece. Right, in order to um, um, uh, see the great establishments of the civilization during that time period, and also um, there's uh, Marco Polo's writings. Right, um, uh, he, he he writes on travel, and he writes his book his book basically in the 13th century. And what are his travels about? It's about actually his actually encounter with other people. He writes about political institutions, religious institutions, exploring. Uh -huh. He's exploring new lands and writing about his observations. Right of the um, his contrast with the other lands, with other people, with uh, their their um, uh, religious beliefs, their traditions, political um, um, establishments and institutions, and and also uh, who else wrote um, uh, wrote on travel? There's Ibn Battuta, and he's um, actually a North African writer who wrote in the 16th um, century. Um, right, Ibn Battuta. He wrote basically in the 14th century. Sorry, um, and he writes. Um, uh, he's he's a well-known traveler, right? The travels of Ibn Battuta. Um, he's from Morocco, basically, and he writes just like Mar Mark Polo. He writes about his observations about the people and the land he gets in contact with. His travels. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's minor Asia, near and far Asia. So he travels um, in, 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 in different re regions and writes about the traditional, the traditions of the people, the beliefs of them, political systems. Um, of, of the time also. And then also there's um, um, other also um, books that were written on travel prior to actually the 18th century. There's Thomas More's Utopia, 
um, that was uh, written uh, in uh, almost, uh, what year did Thomas More write his book, Utopia? He wrote it in 1516, so that's the 16th century. And then um, there's, um, there's Gulliver, uh, there's actually um, Swift, Jonathan Swift, who also an Irish writer, that I mean, Thomas More is an English writer. Then there's Jonathan Swift, an Irish writer, writing Gulliver's Travels about the travels of the protagonists um, um, to different parts and different societies, and then writing um, his observations about them. And, and so the idea is that basically in the history of European literature, there has been a lot of um, travel writing that has been, um, travel that has been written about. And so, and it's, it's written in different genres. There's the history, cultural, political, social, anthropological writings, actually, um, on travel. And, and so they all actually were written also by, like, religious missionaries, it could be, um, or by, actually, um, cartographers and geographers. Um, and, uh, and so there are different types of people who wrote on travel and wrote in different genres. And that's part of the traditional um, European, the European tradition of, of, of travel writing. So the 18th century actually is not the beginning of travel writing. Okay. However, due to the expansion of the Europe and, and, and Europe, Europe's ascendancy as a superpower in the world, and due to the establishment of colonies in the different parts of the world, it becomes more feasible actually for Europe to get in contact with the other, and then there is the emergence of a lot, much more travel writing during that time period. Okay? Okay, so um, now, during the 18th century, um, our book was written, Candide by Wicked, and it is considered um, 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 travel writing, um, a piece on travel. So basically, um, um, we are going to talk a little bit about the writer himself, um, Voltaire, and then we'll talk about his work, Candide, and then we'll start um, addressing major uh, themes and issues discussed in the, in the work itself. So um, about the writer himself, um, Voltaire. Um, who is Voltaire, basically? <laughs> Who is at the secondary because of power to the country? 
and you know, uh, yes, that's the fifty five years of right um, about um fifty five is the mother. Right? So it's both. So it's it's uh, and and Voltaire well, actually attacks both. He criticizes and attacks both in his writing. The religious establishment um, being led by the Catholic Church, and he criticized the government, the monarchs at the time. He criticized Louis XIV, and he was through um, uh, during the reign of Louis XV. Uh, okay, and and so um, he was daring in his writing. He attacked the government. He attacked the church, and thus he would be uh, he he was in, in, in disfavored by the government. Now, when he was imprisoned, actually, for the T17, actually, it was said that he was imprisoned because of people writing that eventually turned out not to be his. But it turned out not to be his. So he was imprisoned um, for um, several years. Um, and this is that. And it doesn't mean that he wasn't still writing, attacking the government and attacking the monarchy. And he ends up actually in prison for several years. And then um, once um, the court uh, ruled that he um, is uh, free, uh, or, or um, ruled that he gets out of the, the, the prison, he is the only, uh, the only actually um, thing um, they allow for him to do is to be is to get out of France. And so he lives in exile um, in in London for for a period of time. And that's when actually he. Um, gets in contact during his exile period. So, like, he has different periods where he gets exiled to different, um, uh, in different um, parts of Europe. And, and during um, his exile in London, at least, he gets um, introduced and, and gets to know a lot of major philosophers during this time period and writers. And among them is actually, um, uh, no, not not um, yeah, Alexander Pope, basically. Um, Shakespeare was writing a century before. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, see, I'm not sure. He, well, he knew a lot of writers. And he met a lot of philosophers. But for the interest of, of our class today, um, it's important that you know that he knew of Alexander Pope, you read for him, because he starts off, starts with Alexander Pope, and he starts off, as, uh, um, um, in, in, you know, in agreement with actually the philosophies and the, the ideas that Alexander Pope writes about. But later on in his life, Voltaire starts attacking Alexander Pope on the basis that Voltaire also attacks the philosophy and becomes more critical and, and very critical of the philosophy that Alexander Pope actually uh, endorses, which is the philosophy of optimism. Okay? Um, anyhow, um, you just have to know this, that, that, that that's basically Voltaire um, was a person who would have but He always wrote about his ideals, uh, about specific ideals and principles, and he would never compromise. And that's why he constantly would fall in favor and out of favor of um, the regime, um, the, the established regime of the time period, and also of, of actually the established government, established governments in the different actually European countries that he lived in. Okay, and and uh, can't win this. He writes uh, basically Voltaire. He writes uh, not Voltaire. I mean Kennedy. He writes it in 1759, and that's actually at the age of 61. And so he's not writing it very early on in his life. It's actually one of the 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 the, 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 the last pieces of of, of uh, literature he writes um, uh, in his life. Um, and, and so you have to know that basically um, it, it addresses one of the last things he believes in. Okay? Um, so um, now how does that affect um, Candide itself? Um, basically, um, uh, Candide was published in 1769, right? And initially when it was published, it was distributed in three different editions in three different capital cities. Paris, Geneva and Amsterdam. And so, uh, why would you think um, it's published in three different editions? In three different capitals? Uh, because it is, yes, attached to the government, attached to the religion. Uh huh. 
So basically, he distributes, um, a, a candidate gets distributed in three different capitals um, in order to have as much copies um, distributed and reach the people prior to the authorities and the government um, confiscating um, copies or actually uh, suppressing them. And so um, actually in uh, his, the, the original copies uh, the, get um, the, uh, published and distributed in January 1759 and then in February 1759 actually the government gets a, gets a hold of his copies, some of his copies, and, and they actually seize them in, in Geneva and Paris and actually come to escape whatever is left from the copies and, and they in attempt to suppress the work altogether. Um, and that tells actually about what um, what the uh, themes and issues he touches on and discusses um, as uh, they were actually bold and and they were an, a direct attack to uh, um, uh, the government of the time. And so, um, when the original copy comes out, it does not bear Voltaire's name. Voltaire's name is not on the original copy, and actually Voltaire does not actually admit being the author of Candide, not until 1768, which is some nine years after the initial publication, right? And, and then there's, uh, the, the, uh, there comes out a copy in 1761, basically with new passages added and rewritings of some of the passages, and that is the copy that actually we are reading. Okay, um, so basically, the title page of was of, of, of Candy um, bears um, um, this inscription from the German of Dr. Rao. From the German of Dr. Rao, and the name of the author was not exposed. Um, so, why do you think um, we can use this strategy? Hiding his name. Mm-hmm. Hiding his name. So, this would be actually the title page that came that was it, that original. Um, so, what actual expectations do we for a title page? This is the original title page that uh, that the uh, uh, basic original copy came out of. Print. So, what are uh, expectations do you get from reading this information on the title page? What is there on the title page? What does it say? You need to start, yes. What? Okay, so basically the copy is not written in the original language, which is French. So if it's written originally and you would have to German, because it's translated from the German. So basically, the original language would be German. And is there a name of the author here? At least you know that it's translated from the German of Dr. Rath, so maybe Dr. Rath would be um, the writer. And then what do we learn about Dr. Rath, who might be the writer of this German um, book? We learn that he's dead. Why? Because when the edition is found in the doctor's pocket, when he died and ended in the year of grace, so we learned that the author also died in that Yeah, I mean, yes, that's who is Dr. Ralph. Is he an actual person in, 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 the, in Germany, at least? Or is he a fake, actually, um, person? The idea is that, well, what we know is that this is a book written by Voltaire. So, um, there is the absence of the name of the author here. And then, too, we learn and we know that Voltaire basically wrote it in French. But then, he mentions that it was translated from German. And so, what was the purpose? Why did Voltaire actually do this? Why did he actually first um, um, uh, leave his name out? So, um, um, his name the author. He leaves his name out, and then he wants the readers, maybe, or he actually, on the title page, there's a translation from a person called Dr. Rao, who is German. And his bed. Exactly, he wanted to avoid persecution. Because even the government, once they see the, the, the book, and they know that it's a criticism of, or a criticism either of, the, of, of the, 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 you know, the political or the religious authority during the country, they're going to have to, they're 
they're going to be after somebody to persecute him. But then the somebody is, is not a writer. He's not a writer. Um, yes, he's a doctor, right? And he's not only just a doctor, he's dead. So um, who are they going to go after, right? Who are they going to persecute? Nobody, right? And in this case, basically, this is a tactic by Voltaire in order to obscure uh, the, the, origin, the origins of this book and to create that kind of mystery around the book where the authorities cannot um, basically um, um, persecute him. And, and the authorities, it's, it's kind of like misleading when he says that the original language is German. So this world, this world actually that is being criticized is not connected to, to France. Um, and but rather to another country. Exactly, he's trying to mislead them, basically, to who to look after. And even if there's somebody to not look after, but actually persecute, but that person is dead. And it's the doctor, not even a, a writer. Um, exactly. Um, so that, that was um, his tactic when publishing the book in order to obscure the originality and, and, and not have the authorities link it to him. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that still wouldn't save a person from persecution, from being persecuted. Even if you're a doctor and you're criticizing um, the religious establishment, you're going to be persecuted. Uh -huh, okay, it could be that um, it's, it's better to the public to give it more um, attention, more respect. Um, it could be, but, but, but still, um, um, we could didn't have problems in having a readership, but he did have problems with the government. And so he did not want um, the book to be actually um, connected to him in, in any manner, even though secretly his readers knew that it was him. Who, he, they knew who the author was. Okay? Um, what else did I want to say about the title page? Well, yeah, that's about it. And so, um, uh, and so the, um, it, it, we just go to that. Um, you learn about this in this case and about this book a little bit. And so that leads us basically to the major, um, uh, major um, theme discussed, or the major, the genre that this book can be classified in. As I told you guys, this book can be considered as travel writing, right? But it's a type of travel writing that actually has a philosophical um, 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 kind of message in it. Yeah. So, um, but, but, but prior to talking about the book itself and the genre that the book um, um, uh, could be classified um, as part of, um, basically there are two works that you have to know um, about that um, what to, uh, that Voltaire uh, read and that either affected by in terms of reacting to or endorsing and building on the same answer. And those are um, basically um, the Thomas Moore in Tokyo that was published in 2016, and also um, uh, Jonathan Swift's um, Gulliver's Travel, published in 1720. Um, basically, uh, when he traveled to, into England, he did meet in his life um, uh, Jonathan Swift. He was an acquaintance with Justin Swift, and he did read uh, basically his book, Full of Earth Travel. Now, why are these books they're basically important for, um, is for you to know? And be, because one is that Thomas, uh, Thomas Moore actually wrote a uh, travel, a fictional narrative that's called Utopia, and in it, he projected imaginary environments based on political principles and ideas, creating a utopian society. Yes. So you guys know what utopia is? Utopia is that perfect place to live in. Um, and it's that imaginary place that Thomas Moore predicted. Um, and, and, and where in that place, actually, there, 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 there is a practice and a part application of political principles and ideas that actually lead eventually to uh, utopian and perfect society. And, and, 
It's inspired, yeah, from Clayton's original, um, uh, utopia. Yeah, from the principles that, that, that Clayton talks about in his utopia. Yeah. And then, um, you have another book on travel. This book is about, um, that, that, uh, was here with the weird. And then he's aware of another book that uses travel as a motif, and that I guess told you guys that Jonathan Swift's book, Gulliver's Travel, that was published in 1726. In Gulliver's Travel, actually Gulliver's Travel kind of like establishes an, 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 a, a contrary um, 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 world to the world that comes more actually um, uh, uh, creating this book. And that is that basically in the book, Jonathan Swift actually criticizes the satire the concept of a perfect society through addressing um, anti-utopian or dystopian, which is the opposite of utopian elements, proving that human per perfectibility is a myth. So they kind of like um, uh, 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 in, in the contrary to one another. One comes more suggesting the fact that 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 a society, a perfect society, can exist if perfect principles and ideals get applied. Where Jonathan Swift actually is testing the limitation of a perfect society. And through um, testing that limitation actually he he actually proves that a perfect society cannot exist. Uh, okay? And human perfectibility is limited. Utopia is just not real and can never be applied in real life. And, and so the, the, the criticism and the satire that Jonathan Swift used in his book, Gomer's Travel, actually is kind of um, the satire that, and it's a, um, a, that, that, that one kind of writes about. Okay? Mm. So that leads us to actually now how do we classify uh, 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 book, um, to what genre does it, it does, it, what genre does it follow? Um, uh, no, not fictional or factual. We, we well, basically, he based his book on two factual, uh, two fictional um, narratives. Utopia is fictional. Hoover's travel is fictional, and so is Candide. Candide is not the actual real um, factual um, travel of an actual historical person. Okay, it, it, it's fictional. But now, um, what kind? What genre does it follow? Does it follow or is it could it be considered a Roman? And a Roman actually is the French word for novel. So from your reading, did you feel like it, it could be classified as a novel? Yes. A novel one. But it's a series of events. But basically, a novel is, um, or is a, or a novel or a novella, a short novel. Basically, if you want to say this could be a short novel. But then, um, it doesn't follow the conventions or the requirements of, of a novel. Because basically, a novel has actually consists of a series of events that build up where we reach, finally, the book reaches a climatic moment. And that climatic moment is a turning point in the events that, that, that builds up. And then we have a resolution of, of action. And so, um, you, the book actually, our book, Candy, it actually consists of short um, voyages compiled together, right? Short trips. You feel like actually every trip has its own um, building of action, kind of like turning point, and not the resolution, but rather a turning point, and then there's um, actually a question posed at the end of each each um, voice. And so um, this is not actually the convention known um, way of writing the novel. It's not, it doesn't follow the convention of, of a novel. And so this, could it be considered a political tale? Uh, uh, not political. Uh, well, philosophical, it could be kind of political. A philosophical tale, from your reading, do you guys, do you get the feel that it's a philosophical tale? The book starts with, once upon a time, and so it is a tale, right? It's, 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 it's when, when, when once upon a time there's no no specific time um, linked to it. It gives you the feel that this is a tale. And so could it be actually labeled as philosophical? Uh, yeah. yeah. Could it be labeled as philosophical? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
had this on the grave. It shows from the island in society that the attention of the genes of the mind is very optimistic in China. And he doesn't have the right, he doesn't have the right uh, the view or the right observation from the genes. So they need to be seen by all these optimistic patients. So we have to forget that actually Voltaire and Candide is trying to impart a message. Teach a message. And that message is philosophical. Okay? And so um, Candide can be seen as closer to being a fable or a parable. What is a fable and a parable? They're short stories that teach a message. Right? And they might be like a moral a message or a mythical message or a religious message. But the point is that they teach a message. And Candide could be considered a work that teaches a message. And now, but um, the method that is teaching, do you feel like it's deep? Is it uh, not deep, I mean? Is it hidden? Do you have to, like, try to dig deep in the events to understand the philosophy? where this is after going through a lot of like um, um, uh, um, events in his life, his fortunes actually, um, he was actually ended with posing a question of whether this is the best of all possible worlds, or saying that this is, a, this is the best of all possible worlds, and trying to believe, make himself believe in that, in that philosophy. So it is a philosophical message, right? And it is sort of a philosophical message, but then is what they actually endorsing this philosophical message or criticizing this philosophical message and showing the limitation. And, or, or actually the, 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 the limitations of this message. Um, that's where actually comes to the point where it is at that time. Is Voltaire actually endorsing the philosophy that despite human suffering, despite the fact that human beings go through misfortune, the world is the best of all, the, whatever happens is the best of all possible world, or is what they're actually trying to criticize it and satirize it? Uh-huh. You find that he's satirizing it. What is the definition of satire? When we talk about the word that, that is satire, and there's satire, it's because the people's ideas that they are wrong. Not only ideas, Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so the very generally is finding that in the school or not the feeling or the shortcoming of individuals, institutions, and society. Okay? So um is this part of the writing is this writing actually mocking um on uh, the uh, the shortcomings and the failings of an institution or a society or you know, whatever the religious institution is, political or religious institution. Is it doing that through ridicule and mock and scorn? Oh, you're talking about specific uh, 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 incidents in the in the in the book. But let's just go to the basic um, philosophy almost that is being presented in the book, and let's see if if if, if it's actually. Um, approached and, and presented in a mock, in a ridicule manner, in a mock story manner. But do you make fun, actually? This what can make you laugh at actually the failings of, of a specific point. Let's just go, just so you see, if, if this is a satire or not, go to um, the book and go to page basically four. And here we're introduced to Pangloss, which is the philosopher, the mentor, and the teacher um, in, in the book. To, he's, the, he's the one who teaches um, the Baron's son, and, and also Candide learns a lot of philosophy from this, uh, from this, this man. He's a mentor teacher um, to Candide. Look what he says in terms of philosophy. He's trying to teach Candide a message. And he says, page four, he's trying to make rational, rational statements and judgments. He says, it is demonstrable. This is page four, um, paragraph one, two, three. Okay? 
It is the demonstrable, he would say, that things cannot be other than as they are. For since everything is made to serve it and everything has been studied for the best of it, observe how noses will form to support testicles. Therefore, we have testicles. Legs are clearly divided for the wearing of breeches. Therefore, we wear breeches. Um, stones were formed to be moved and made into castles. Hence, the source of beautiful castles. For the greatest spirit in the province must perform the, the best power. And since pigs were made to be eaten, they eat for all year round. Consequently, those who have argued that all is well have been talking nonsense. They should have said that all is for the best. So what do you think about the philosophy? No, this are formed to support spectacles and tennis, and therefore we have spectacles. And I do feel like this is ridiculous to be the case. Okay? 
And uh, he also, you don't have to know that basically one of also the very um, um, the very prominent English writers at the time of the book is North, actually, up to the time. It's like kind of like a religious philosophy um, that was followed by people in the 18th century. He's one of the also uh, prominent figures who promoted this philosophy in his writing.
And so let's look at, at parts of the teachings of, of uh, lesbian, uh, lesbian view, I mean. Um, so, um, lesbian, what does he believe in? His view actually, his views are basically um, based on the nature of God. So that's why it's not just a secular philosophy we're talking about, it's a religious philosophy. That Lippin stands for and Pangloss parodies actually. Um, or or the the what's the parodies a credit character of uh One, since the creator is both omnipotent and omnipotent, and since he wished that this creature be happy in the world he made was one that secured the most, um, intensity. This is one of the teachings of uh, that that was this, um, uh, as part of the philosophy of optimism. Um, do you guys understand what this? You don't know what omnipotence means. What omnipotence? Omnipotence means all knowing. Omnipotence means all powerful. So this is the nature of God. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. And so um, um, He's the Creator, right? He's also the creator, all knowing and all powerful, and he creates the universe and creates people. So he um wish um and since he wished for his creatures to be happy then the world he made was one that secured the most contentedness for um the people. So people have to submit and surrender to the all powerful, all knowing in whatever happens to them. They still have to believe that God but wanted them to be content. But, okay, so you're linking it to that this could be the best of all possible worlds because it's free. It's God. Well, God created people. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. And for sure, God wants the best for people. Okay, so this is a point of where, yes, one should submit to However, 
um, it's part of a grand universal plan. Okay? And who knows that grand universal plan? Who says that? Who knows it? Who's the all-knowing? God. And only God with his serene overview, with his his, he has the ability to see the wider picture. He's out of the frame of his creatures. And he has, he can see the wider picture. And so, only him, he saw everything and how, he saw how everything fits well and serves a greater good. Okay? And so, um, since God is perfect by nature and by definition, which allows and follows that actually he cannot do wrong. So these are the basic tenets, basic teachings, basic um, of, of the philosophy of optimism that was supported by actually Lutheran. And who can was actually represent in his work. And who was his satirizer, right? And criticizes that. <laughs> And you mean really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This resonates um, in, in, in the Islamic philosophy and the science belief. Yeah. Um, but I think he's so unsuitable and he the about the Bible. It means that even for the most important people, they shouldn't be in the same Exactly, that's what he's saying. He's saying that the unfortunate, the people who suffer, um, and you said uh, being suffering from poverty could be one. So the person accepts their, their, their fate in life because actually their suffering is only part of God's plan for them. And eventually it's the best of all worlds. It should serve um, something greater than what a human being on an individual level can see. So human beings should see beyond the suffering and see that there is something good that will emerge from their uh, negative experience or from their bad luck or from this, their misfortune. And whether that would be in the best actually see is in this life or the afterlife, um, it, it, it would be a possible. It, it, it would be possible. So it's not necessarily that they see that the rest of the world is actually something that could be achieved also in the real life. It could be achieved in the afterlife. Yeah, I'm going to say that the people who are not going to be able to do that. Submit? Yes, I'm going to say that people who are not going to be able to do that. Submit? Yes, I'm going to say that the message is actually to submit to the all powerful, all knowing, not questioning actually. Um, uh, faith and, and what's happening to their lives because, yeah, they really don't have a choice. They really don't have a choice. And so, actually, the best way is to, um, um, uh, to believe that, believe in God, basically, who knows it all and does have a grand universal sense that eventually serves for the best of humanity and serves the best of humanity. And it's God's will. And, 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 yeah, as you said, you can see that resonance in the science philosophy. And because in the, in the concept of, like, there's a key fair to question Even when somebody's tested by the death of, of maybe even um, um, one of their close, you know, close, dear persons, right? The idea is that you should not just bear because God chose that and has a better plan for the person who died and for you as well. Actually, it's the opposite. Not to put it for me. You should believe that all of our values that I want to be sure. But that doesn't mean that we should be sorry. I understand. I understand about you. Because not everybody is saying something that's true. Even what's good for him is not good for me. This is not a general basis we should all follow. I mean, to say something. Something. Blind submission, you mean? So they have to see. Exactly. Okay, I got what you're saying. Yes. And so do you think what this is, 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 is giving space for people to think? 
No. Yes, he's taking away a kind of guy that privilege and saying that those are just things. And it's just a limit to the fact that that the world is 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 governed or, or the designed by an all-knowing, all-powerful um, um, God who um, uh, knows that this is the best of, past, of, of the possible world and knows that the best um, world is actually um, he will have it um, because he's all -known. And so you see, you're set back and you're separate as something positive without thinking about it. And what they're saying is that by that rising, you actually do. If you think that's what you start thinking, towards the end, it's actually he and more than another stuff. But I'm not going to say whether it's good or not, or that you're going to have to read till the end. It's kind of like on the last day of the season. You learn that, and that one can be. Start actually, like, um, he actually started and leaves this philosophy, to he read it for a minute. But another that, um, that never happens actually, because once you read, um, the last, the end of the, the story. And we'll talk about it later. Okay? Okay. And so, this was the spirit of the age. Optimism was, uh, philosoph a philosophy, a religious philosophy that people were following. A lot of people were following him in the eighteenth century. Um, however, however, two major events took place in Europe that actually shook the belief in optimism altogether. All together. And that is one I don't know why the lights are Okay. One is the Lisbon the Lisbon Earth crisis. That took place and happened in 1755. This is a natural disaster, not caused by human beings, okay? And it caused the death of thousands of people. Actually, it was saying that it caused the death of 300,000 people. And what was that date that actually the earthquake hit? It was the 1st of November, and it was an, a, a religious festival. It was Old Saints Day, right? Where a lot of people were mad, and there was. Yeah? Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that's the modern day um, naming of it. Yes. All things today. Exactly. Um, so people were actually engaging in religious festivity when this disaster, um, when this natural disaster hit. And it's the earthquake was And it led like, to the death of 300,000 people, right? And so what does it, it do to um, the, the belief system of they start questioning this God, who's supposed to actually have a universal plan that serves to best, right? People die in, in mass numbers, and, and for them, no apparent um, reason. There's no cause. They, they don't see that, what, what, what the, the cause could be, the rational cause could be for such of a punishment. Um, right? Okay. And so it lost the belief in optimism, basically. Because after this, this, this earthquake, it killed thousands of people. And all, some of the people who survived after the earthquake got killed by the following tsunami on that, that earthquake. Right? And, 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 and so it was, it was like a tragedy on a bad scale. Um, and, and two, um, the Seven Year War that took place in 1766, and 1763 um, also contributed in, in shaking people's beliefs in optimism. Okay? Now, uh, so we take this way, from 1763, we have up to uh, 10 in 1769, right? And so, this, this Seven Year War, actually, Seven Year War, what was it? It was a, a, a major war that could be even considered on a world, um, kind of like world war, um, that, that actually um, accomplished that many European countries were involved to, involved in and, and, and fought against. Uh, there is England, France, uh, Holland, um, Denmark, different countries got engaged in, and also later on, actually, the United uh, North America was engaged in this, this war. And it caused this to thousands and thousands of people. And so, um, basically, this kind of also um, left was head and uh, along with a lot of other people, um, um, not, you know, not believing that a world that's ravaged by war um, could be the best of all possible worlds. Okay? And so, um, 
That's about it regarding actually the philosophy itself. So, okay, these major events happen. It's it almost entirely the belief system and optimism. But now, this resident continues to champion for and continues to defend the philosophy of optimism. Yes, he did. And what were basically his rationalizations? He had an insistence on the fact that in the ultimate scheme of things, in the ultimate scheme of things, there exists a specific reason for each and every event, fully able to account for even this unfortunate seeming aspect. Unfortunate seeming aspect. So when he says that basically, Exactly, in the, in the, in the ultimate um, scheme of things, in, the, in, the, in the, that grand plan that humans are not, because humans are not omniscient, they can't, they don't know, they can't see, they don't have that overview, actually, um, actually there is this reason. So, if it's a misfortune, there's a reason for the misfortune. If you, you, you suffer, if a human being suffers, if humanity suffers, there is a sufficient reason for it, but human beings cannot see it. That's why you don't understand it. Uh huh. Yeah, and their observation is limited. Exactly. And so, um, what is seemingly unfortunate is really not. It's just part of that plan that that, that individuals cannot see. Fully. We just see partial truth. We see partially through our own experiences, but we can't see the overview, the full picture. Um, that God has, right? And he continues to say that. What is that reason? What is that specific reason? Actually, it stems from the scientific view that all happenings are part of that absorbable um, web of cause and effect, which nothing can divert. So anything that happens in the world, still, part of the reasoning, and the reasoning is because there is a cause for everything. There is a cause, and then for a cause, there is an effect. So with the effects of suffering and, and pain, there's necessarily a cause for it. That makes sense for God, and it serves the grand plan, right? And now, where does that actual rationalization come from? Actually, from, from the religious doctrine. That was advanced by the Catholic Inquisition, um, that people are responsible for the wrongs in the world because their nature is corrupt. The cause is, because human beings, the nature is corrupted, the effect is the suffering. So that's sufficient reason for why suffering is in the world. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, but now we are going to drive this. Actually, it comes from actually a religious Catholic belief in the original sin. And what is the original sin? The fall of mankind, which was Adam's sin originally. Yeah, what was his sin? And he, he disobeyed by God uh, by eating the forbidden apple, right? And then he would seek out of paradise. And, and ever since, human suffering begins on earth. And so basically, um, that means that there is no way you can divert any punishment um, that God um, imposes upon people because it comes originally from the nature of human beings and from the original sin that our original father committed. And so that's how actual this makes it, it, it says that it makes perfect sense to everybody, the fortunate and the unfortunate. Okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is that this one has scissors, could have yeah. left every mission. We are, exactly, yeah. We are been abandoned by God into um, um, a world of suffering. Uh -huh. Okay, because, the, yeah, he just obeyed. So the idea is that whether you, on an individual level, commit a mistake or a wrong or not, still you will suffer for the mistakes and the wrongdoing as well. Either others in the universe or because of the mistake of our father, original father, Adam. This is what you said? An effect. Reasoning, 
for everything to prove that it's overall for the best. Till the very end, even when he actually um, survives the hanging, uh, not everyone's question is to go here. He travels to um, South America with Kennedy to first morning. Uh, yes, there's a storm where actually he actually witnesses the death of the Anabaptist, a very good man who, who cured him from his disease. And so he sees that this man dies almost for no reason it's because of the storm. It's an actual disaster, like natural um, element that, that, that actually kills um, this great man. And so Ken Watts continues to make reason to that every event, every misfortune, every suffering, um, it's only just um, um, and what um, it can be actually rationalized and it can be said that it serves a better purpose. It serves a, you know, a, a, a better end and it serves the greater plan that God has for people. And here the last continues from the beginning to the end upholding his very same philosophical viewpoint. Yes that this is the best of all worlds. Um, and because um, and, uh, Voltaire kind of like um, puts him into these trials, these small trials and setbacks, Voltaire is trying to make fun of him, that basically when he tries to rationalize misfortune in a very irrational manner, we would see. Um, so that's part of the ridicule and satire of both men I feel Okay, so now, um, what we're going to have to do is we talked about what this would do and how it would be, um, how it is upheld, or how they are upheld by Pangloss. And Pangloss is considered a caricature um, uh, to, um, uh, 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 caricature of um, you, This is um, kind of like um, an activity you have to do. Um, where um, now we're going to look at not Leibniz's views of optimism, but rather we're going to look at lines by Alexander Pope, written um, in his essay on man. Okay, um, where is that? That's the exercise activity four. It's going to be on page one eighty three. Okay, so you're going to have to read just this, 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 these lines from Alexander Pope's essay on man and try to first analyze this and see what views he proposes. In, in, in his um, poem, in his uh, in these lines, and then you try to actually link them to Leibniz's um, uh, views, and then the second activity, after we analyze this poem almost together, um, we're going to have to compare these views to um, Pangloss's views, and what his satire of those views in chapter 5. Okay? It's not just comparing concepts, it's actually see how they figure in chapter 5 and how what they're talking about and satirizing. Okay? Let's all go to page 183. One eighty two. One eighty two, one eighty three. Okay, there. You get to activity four. So these are the concluding, this is the concluding stanza of the first epistle from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Um, you're going to have to summarize his arguments in your own words, okay? I, I, wanna, I want to do this activity together with you guys so we can um, actually see what these views are, try to link them, and see how similar or different they are from Lepnitz's views, and then um, we'll do the, acti the second activity, which is kind of comparing these views to um, what they're used in chapter 5, okay? Um, who wants to read these lines? Yeah, who wants to read? Yes.
Okay. So what are Pope's views and the response? Okay. Uh, degree of blindness, weakness, heaven is owed on thee. Which means that even though human beings are not omniscient, they are not all-knowing, there are points where you know, because humans don't know everything, actually heaven is owed on thee, which means that, that who, um, it's God who knows best. It's normal. God knows that people are, are, are not omniscient. But God knows all. And it's always referred to um, basically God. Right? And what else? Seize this. Submit. There's those. Seize this. And then submit to one eventually clear message which is whatever it is, is right. And what is whatever it is? The discord in life or the harmony? The bad or good? Um, all chance, direction also. Partial evil, universal good. All of this is actually um, part of one truth that is clear, and that is whatever it is, God creates is right. And so, Okay, so um, your your job here is to read chapter five 
a reread chapter five, it's just like almost two pages, right? Six and a half. And when you read it, you have to contrast what Tim's views with Alexander Pope. Um, I was thinking that you might want to help them. We're not going to be reading the chapter together. We have to be part of it. But, um, so, just a reminder, what is chapter five about? Where is that episode in, episode in, in, in Candid and, and, uh, and Pangloss's uh, voyage? Okay, yeah, it's actually storm, shipwreck, earthquake, and what became of Dr. Pangloss, Candid, and James, or James, or James, the end, the end of Africa. Okay. Now, so I'm not, I'm assuming that you've read all, um, you've, you've read the, the, the whole tale. Um, you've read what the chapters that come be, before this. So basically, um, what is this chapter about? Where, where do we start? We start actually with, after the Anabaptists. Remember when I said that he was was found by Candy, um, and with, Scars and, and sores, and, and he was infected by a disease, right? And then he was like a knife candy, right? Um, and then um, and he tells Candy about what happened to the Baron and the Baroness and how the little Baron actually attacked the castle. And then he tells him that he got this um, disease transmitted to him from the maid of the house, right? But then he says that he's afraid that he cannot be healed from the disease because he costs a lot, right? He, 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 it requires a lot of fortune in order to be, um, to, to be cured from the disease. And so Candy, uh, who was already saved and provided food and shelter by a very good man who is an Anabaptist, right? He actually saves or, or takes um, um, Pangloss from him and says that, oh, he can cure you. He can maybe um, take care of you. And yes, Candy takes um, um, Pangloss to the Anabaptist and says the Anabaptist refuses by helping Pangloss. No, he accepts, right? And then he helps him get cured and he continues to provide shelter and food for both. And then one day the Anabaptist wants to go on a business trip, right? That's where the, um, we're going to talk about, on a business trip to Lisbon, right? And so he takes along with him Pangloss and Candide. And so they go on a, on a, on a, on a ship, right? Crossing the Gauls to Lisbon. A little bit before um, um, reaching Lisbon, what happens? A storm takes place. So the, the, the chapter 5 is about the storm that takes place, right? And the storm actually um, destroys um, the ship because of the shipwreck. And a lot of people who are on board perish during the storm. And what happened to the end of that man? He drowned. How did he drown? He tries to save the sailor, or the sailor, right? And so he saves him, and as a result, he falls into the sea and drowns. And without even a sailor, after he saves the sailor, the sailor kind of, kind of kicks him um, and lifts, lifts him back, okay, or drowns. And so, Bangalore and Candide observes this. And, 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 and Candide wants to even actually maybe jump after the Anabaptist and save him. But Pangloss prevents him, right? And what does Pangloss say? Prevents him on what basis? No, I'm not. Yes, there is. He tries to make a, a, a rationalization through providing a cause and effect. He says here, look at the um, chapter 5, page 13. Uh, it's the very first long paragraph, you, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines before the end. Look at that. Pangloss, the philosopher, prevents him, prevents Candy from saving on um, the Anabaptist. Arguing that Lisbon uh, Harbor was built expressly so that the Anabaptist should one day drown in it. While he was offering the priority proofs of this, the vessel split and everyone perished, with the exception of Pangloss, Candide, and the same bruise of the sailors who had drowned their virtuous Anabaptists. And so, 
Okay, he does provide a cause and effect. Does it make sense to you guys? So he's saying basically that the harbor was built actually for the Anabaptists to, to um, drown in it, and so it's part of it. So see, that reasoning is not sufficient enough for you guys, right? Uh, uh, yeah, he's just saying that well, the harbor was built from the start for the Anabaptists to, to drown in it. <laughs> uh, it's his destiny, actually, yeah. So, uh, uh, and that's one event that takes place in chapter 5. So, the, he's trying to provide cause and effect. And so, what's that? Is, is, is he endorsing this or is he mocking it? He's mocking it because the rationalization just does not stand. It seems like it's, it's ridiculous um, to rationalize it in that specific way, right? And so, then, what is the other misfortune that accompanies um, our travelers um, once they reach Lesbar? Once they reach it, the earthquake hit. And what happens? Many, many people are being, are, 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 are you know, the, the lives of these people are being devastated. Many die, thousands, their houses are destructed, roofs fall upon, the, you know, the people. And they die. And so, um, in this case, um, what is Tanglas' take on the earthquake? How did he rationalize the earthquake and the suffering it causes for this, these people, the destruction that it causes? How does, what is his view on optimism here? Actually, Pangloss tries to console Candide and, and other survivors who are lamenting and crying for the loss of their loved ones, their houses, the destruction of the town. He says there it is on page 15. Yeah. He says basically here, addressing them, look, uh, they, they, this is after the earthquake, the survivors are having a meal. Um, by those who are charitable. Um, so he says, the meal was a melancholy one. It is true, and the guests watered the bread with their tears, but Pangloss consoled them, assuring everyone that things could not be otherwise. This is all for the best, he said, for if there is a volcano, a volcano between those bonds, then it can't be anywhere else, for it is impossible for things to be elsewhere than where they are, for all things. Well, and so what about this? He's trying to console people by saying that, well, basically there is a volcano under this one, and that's the reason why an earthquake hit. And it just totally makes sense that um, the earthquake that hits this area, and the volcano is just where it is. So, so he's trying to say that there is a cause, but it seems that his rationalization is still absurd. Right? And so basically, Voltaire is trying to mock um, this um, uh, Pangloss' rationalization of the misfortunate and unfortunate events of one, the shipwreck and the death of the Anabaptists or the drowning of the Anabaptists and the earthquake, actually. He's trying to rationalize them and say that this is the best um, that could have ever happened and trying to um, make that cause effect relationship that doesn't hold, doesn't seem sound, and doesn't seem rational. And doesn't offer actual consol consoling to, um, doesn't consolidate the people, right? And, um, what else? So this proves the limitations of Pangloss's optimism and Pangloss's philosophy. He just tries to impose rationalization. However, his rationalization is, 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 is basically not, you know, it doesn't touch reality as it is, and it's basically lunatic. Okay? Uh, and then, okay, what happens afterwards to, within this chapter, to Pangloss and Candy? No, right in, in, in right after this, this uh, scene, what takes place within chapter five? Yes. What happens after watching the thing and 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 having their food and playing lots of philosophizing about this earthquake being the best of all possible worlds? It's enraged.
ages down through the Inquisition, right? Actually, agents of the Inquisition after the earthquake are looking for people who are considered heretics, who actually might be the sinners who cause uh, God to be here, uh, to be angry at, at human beings and, and thus um, uh, cause the earthquake as punishment. So actually when they hear King Hospital advising about the best of all possible worlds, they think that he's a heretic, right? And they say that this could not be after the best of all kinds of worlds. Why? Because basically Pangolin is preaching what they believe in, but they misunderstand him. And thus, they capture him and and Candide and they they want to hang him and burn him on the stake. Right? So actually Pangolin is kind of like um and uh, punished for his own views that that are misunderstood. And that's part of the, 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 the you know, the sarcasm and, and uh, satire that was his, his attempting, attempting in this episode. Okay? Um, what else? So, um, yeah, these are three incidents where you feel like optimism is um, being um, exposed or, 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 or uh, um, uh, articulated in, a, in the, the most inadequate manner, in a very limited um, 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 reasoning, reasoning that doesn't make sense. Kind of in the, it's, it's all um, the rationalizations in an inadequate, and it does reflect in this case what the mockery and the sense the tire of these ideas actually is just like reflecting what it is not of the theory of optimism that with this, and the ideas and the ideas of optimism that are expressed in the um, in the poem by Alexander Pope. Right? Okay, um so um we're done for today's discussion. And so um uh, for next time, you're just going to have to prepare the rest of the, for, you know, prepare the rest of the chapter, and we're going to be looking at Condigan's um, uh, uh, journey or voyage. We're going to look at also Candy's um, uh, journey, and we're going to look at also Kakambo, another um, major character that that, that appears during Candy's um, trip. And also, we, I want you to pay special attention to a character that appears but not in the work. Um, and his name is Martin, or Martin, Martin or Martin. Actually, he appears and he holds a philosophy that could be seen as the opposite, or the opposite of the grand logic philosophy. So, um, look at Martin's character, his philosophy, and compare it while you're reading to Pangloss's, okay? And then, the ending is especially um, important in order to see actually can be um, eventually, um, the way um, his his conversion from the philosophy of optimism and in favor of another uh, uh, philosophy that you're going to have to kind of figure out while you're reading. Okay.